indeed in the Messenger of Allah, you have a good example to follow. He who obeys the Messenger has obeyed Allah. I have been given superiority over the other prophets. I have been made victorious with terror cast in hearts of the enemy. Spoils have been made lawful to me, and the line of prophets is closed with me. And while I was sleeping, the keys of the treasures of the world were brought to me and put in my hand. Muhammad's ultimate goal in the use of terror was to establish Islam. He ordered his generals, Fight in the name of Allah and in the way of Allah. Fight against those who disbelieve in Allah. Make a holy war. When you meet your enemies, invite them to three courses of action. Invite them to accept Islam. If they respond to you, accept it from them and desist from fighting against them. If they refuse to accept Islam, demand from them the non-Muslim tax. If they agree to pay, accept it from them and hold off your hands. If they refuse to pay the tax, seek Allah's help and fight them. I have been commanded to fight people until they testify that there is no God but Allah and that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. If they say it, they have saved their blood and possessions from me. A man came to Allah's apostle and said, Instruct me as to such a deed as equals jihad in reward, he replied. I do not find such a deed. One who died but did not fight in the way of Allah, nor did he express any desire or determination for jihad, died the death of a hypocrite. In the Quran, Muhammad was very specific about jihad for the purpose of converting non-Muslims. So when you meet and fight jihad in Allah's cause, those who disbelieve, smite their necks till when you have killed and wounded many of them, then bind the bond firmly on them, take them as captives, Thus you are ordered by Allah to continue in carrying out jihad against the disbelievers till they embrace Islam and are saved from the punishment in the hell fire or at least come under your protection. Asma, the daughter of Marwan, wrote verses against Muhammad. Do you expect good from him after the killing of your chiefs? Like a hungry man waiting for a cook's broth? Is there no man of pride who would attack him by surprise and cut off the hopes of those who expect aught from him? Ibn Ishaq records these words. When the apostle heard what she had said, he said, Who will rid me of Marawan's daughter? Umayyar, who was with him, heard him, and that very night he went to her house and killed her. In the morning he came to the apostle and told him what he had done. You have helped God and his apostle, O oh, Umayr. Asma was murdered in her bed while she held her baby at Muhammad's order and with his congratulations because she had insulted Muhammad. The apostle said, Kill any Jew that falls into your power. Our attacks upon God's enemy cast terror among the Jews, and there was no Jew in Medina that did not fear for his life. The last hour would not come unless the Muslims will fight against the Jews, and the Muslims would kill them until the Jews would hide themselves behind a stone or tree. And a stone or a tree would say, Muslim, or the servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill him. Safiya was married to Kinana, one of the chiefs of Kaibar, who was the tribe's treasurer. 
Kinana was dragged before Muhammad. Muhammad demanded the gold. Kinana told him there was none to be had. Sadly, another Jew informed Muhammad that Kinana was hiding the wealth at a nearby ruin. Muhammad told Kinana, You know that if we find it in your position, I shall kill you. Kinana said yes and prepared to die. Muhammad's men found some of the gold. Muhammad demanded Kinana surrender the rest. Again, Kinana bravely refused. So Muhammad gave orders to his men. Torture him until you extract what he has. So he kindled a fire with flint and steel on his chest until he was nearly dead. The apostle delivered him to Muhammad, son of Maslama, and he struck off his head. After Kinana was dead, Muhammad took the man's beautiful young bride, Safiya, for a sex slave. The Quran has several passages that teach that a Muslim may have lawful sex with his wives, up to four of them, and with his female slaves captured in war. A slave, in Islamic and Quranic terminology, is referred to as what thy right hand possesses. O Prophet, we have made lawful to thee thy wives to whom thou hast bid their dowers, and those whom thy right hand possesses out of the prisoners of war whom Allah has assigned to thee. And thou who guard their chastity except with their wives and their captives whom their right hands possess, for then they are not to be blamed. 